Yeah. That's great. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome everybody uh, again to today's talk. Um, today we are going to be talking about design thinking, um, which will cover, I suppose, all aspects of how we go about the business of design, and specifically in our case, product design. Um, now, I, I, I say pro product design, but I suppose it is a very broad term. It will encompass, uh, you know, obviously things like UX design, which is a big field today, which we'll talk about la later on, uh, and service design, which, you know, a lot of you might be thinking, thinking of um you're you're not necessarily designing physical things uh, you might want to you know create a new service that pe people can use uh, we don't delve too much i suppose into the area of web design and the whole world of uh you know using products and services on the web uh, certainly we can ask or, or answer quite questions on that if you have have any uh, now, I'm going to be talking about uh, processes that you might use later on. Um, we're looking at packaging design as well, uh, just a little bit uh, towards the end of today. And I will take a break roughly halfway just for a minute or two, just if, uh, you know, if you need to use the facilities or make a cup of tea. Okay, let's, uh, let's get, a, get a start. Um, so let's uh, start, I suppose, today by looking at the definition of what design is. Um, I always like to kind of start with this because people, I suppose, have various understandings of what design is, what it means to them. Uh, it means a different thing to each person, I suppose. Uh, for me, it has always been, I suppose, the... Uh, process of solving problems so that you know that is a multitude of things it's not just um, about you know uh, coming up with a, 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 an idea or making a sketch of it um, it's not necessarily a product it's not necessarily a physical thing it's just solving problems that humans have in an effective way so in every sense, uh, design causes change, and that transforms the environment that we live in and work in. So it's very important, obviously, to understand what are, I suppose, the standard uh, methods that designers use uh, to create things and to come up with uh, uh, new pro products. I've just shown on, on the right-hand side of uh, these slides uh, some uh, I, I suppose, stand out products and uh, designers. So you might check out some of those names yourself on, on, on the web. Now, to look at the Oxford Dictionary, um, what does it say about design? It says it's to conceive, invent, and to contrive, to form a plan for, uh, to be responsible for the design of a particular thing, a building, state set whatever it might be and also to have it have as a goal or purpose or to intend to do something so it hasn't actually said anything there about uh, making a drawing it's talking about uh, I suppose conceiving of uh, an idea and to and to create goals which is very important it also talks uh, about invention. Um, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, designers didn't really exist as such, uh, uh, or certainly they were called by other other names. Uh, inventors, well, that that was a commonly used term uh, to describe uh, people who were creative and invented new pro products. Uh, so that is very much a core uh, aspect of what product designers do. They are tasked with inventing new things very often, new ways of doing things. And further down, it says it's also a drawing or a sketch, a decorative or artistic work. 
pattern making. Many years ago, um, you know, a designer or person that designed things was involved with actually creating uh, kind of uh, graphic pa patterns which could be used in architectural work or interior work, um, patterns for use in textiles, textile printing. Um, so it was quite a specific term then. Um, what else uh, does it does it say? Um, it has it has a lot of bearing, I suppose, on uh, uh, you know the description of who designers uh, are. When we look at the broad kind of um, uh, viewpoint that it takes there, let's mo move on into critical thinking in design. Now, there's a couple of specific terms that I want to. Uh, show you here. The first and most important aspect of uh, learning about pro product design is how we think. And I suppose the two uh, ways in which we can think about design are those of analysis and syn synthesis. Just to uh, get an understanding of those, analysis is obviously the breaking down of the particular pro pro problem that you might have, um, and that is to understand each part of it. Synthesis, on the other hand, is combining multiple different elements or ideas into a whole uh, to create your idea. So let's look at that in a slightly different graphic here. Um, so we have the same two, analysis and synthesis, uh, where on the left-hand side, we analyze a particular stimulus or a problem here in the middle, and we create lots of ideas around that. So you might have uh, the likes of a brainstorm or a mind map, uh, which would give you lots of directions in which you, you can take. Uh, Synthesis or convergent thinking uh, is where you have a whole series of facts. So you do lots and lots of research, uh, co collect data on the particular area. Um, again, you write those down on, you know, on a page. And you might, for instance, uh, see certain, um, certain facts or certain data uh, coinciding in certain ways, which could give you um, directions to take. You might take a couple of random ideas or facts and combine them to create some, something new. So there are kind of just, just very generally two ways in which we can think. You might have also heard of uh, vertical and lateral thinking. Um, we all know what uh, vertical thinking is, it's the traditional kind of standard logical uh, way in which we can go about something. You have a certain sequence of uh, action or thought. Lateral thinking, we've all heard of it. Um, it was, I suppose, uh, derived by a philosopher um, called uh, Edward de Bono many years ago, probably 40 year, years ago or so. Um, and that essentially makes us uh, think about things in a slightly different way. It's more random. Um, he talks there in, in his quote about uh, being wrong, that sometimes you need to take side steps. You know, if you're confronted with a barrier, uh, we take a, take a side step and see if we can go, go around it. So the barrier, uh, you know, is being wrong. Uh, it's taking a misstep. And we need to, to be creative about which direction we take next. Um, so these are ways, you know, I suppose, methods that we can use uh, to get our brains to think in different ways. Another interesting theory that you might all check out uh, is that of U theory. Uh, it's a relatively new theory. Uh, uh, I suppose, method we can use to think about a particular thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a problem as such. 
uh, derived by um, Otto Scharmer Char about 35 years ago and has been developed by, I suppose, motivational speakers, uh, philosophers and, and, and psychologists uh, to get people to uh, delve deeper into the subconscious uh, when it comes to thinking about ideas. You can just see one of the um, diagrams that they use there where uh, if you're in a particular workshop um, with a facilitator, they might take a group through a whole series of steps where they get you to uh, listen, to observe, to sense your surroundings. Uh, and that, that curve, that U shape, is to get you delving deep into uh, whatever idea or whatever topic that you might be working on in that particular class. So you see this U theory being used in a lot of kind of design workshops around 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 the world. And you go on then uh, further further down the path to create uh, various thoughts and ideas, prototype, and then actually test. So it's one, it's, you know, if you're interested in this area, you can certainly check it out. Now, uh, design think thinking has had uh, various, you know, um, important junctures along, along the way and terms uh, that have been derived. You've probably all heard of this one. It's probably the most famous of them all, form follows fun function. Um, People, I suppose, today would associate it with the early modernist movement, uh, which came, came about, I suppose, uh, during the Bauhaus uh, per period about 100 years ago. Um, but it was actually a Jesuit monk uh, which derived the uh, term uh, in the early 1700s. Uh, and he, I suppose, uh, derived the term by looking at uh, studying architectural forms, uh, certainly in, in uh, uh, Greek and Roman time, times, and looking at how architects and designers use particular materials to create various forms. So he was, he was very much uh, thinking about, well, a particular material, like a large block of stone, it has, um, I suppose, limits in which it can be used. Um, you know, it can't stretch too far or it might crack or break. Um, it can't be cut too fine or it, it, will, it will, you know, break as well. So there are limits to every material in terms of its structural strength and the, and the form that it can take. So uh, that term, I suppose, he started to use in some of his writings at the time. And it was adopted much later on by so many designers uh, where they, they, I suppose, wanted to pare back what they were doing to create functional things first and foremost, uh, which were followed then by how they looked, what form they, they uh, took. Now, this is an interesting diagram that I always like, like to show, uh, and it looks at, I suppose, that problematic concept of form and fun function. Uh, and the question, as it says there, should not be uh, what aspects of form should be omitted or traded for function, but rather what aspects of the de design are critical to success. So, uh, so a good way or a Good example to use there is that of a clock face. Um, we all know that you know the kind of functional digital clock on the left hand side is is the by far the easiest uh, to read. You know, you you take a glance at it and instantly you know what time time it is. On the right hand side, we we have I suppose you know a more beautiful form or. Uh, formalistic approach to telling the time but as most of you know it's quite difficult to read that clock 
uh, you know, depending on where it is and whether there's light on the clock and so on. Um, so it's not necessarily functional, it doesn't function very well. So can we achieve a balance of the two? So it's kind of like a sliding rule there in terms of the more functional way to do something and the formal. So it's an interesting kind of look at if you have a have a idea or a, a product, um, what's the best form and what is the best fun function? You know, uh, very often the functional one doesn't look right, uh, but it functions well. So can we achieve that interesting or fine balance between the two? Now, another person who, I suppose, derived some interesting uh, thoughts on function uh, was a man called Victor Papanek. Uh, this man uh, is, a, is a kind of a standout figure, a guru, if you like, in terms of design. Um, passed away in the 90s, uh, but wrote uh, a whole series of books on product design and I suppose s sustainability. Um, he famously wrote one in the late 60s called Design for the Real World, um, which I've listed uh, in our set of links, which uh, Stuart is going to put up on the site for, for you all. Um, I would, you know, if I was to recommend a single book from this whole course, uh, that book would certainly be one. Um, it's perhaps a little bit dated now uh, in certain ways. It, it was updated along, along the way, but um, covers so many aspects of uh, design thinking and the way we approach our, our work uh, and has a lot of relevance. It was written at a, at a time uh, of, of the first kind of oil crisis uh, in the early 70s. Um, and I suppose we're going through a whole series of crises now. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of aspects of the book are very re relevant. But he came up with a, a thing called the, uh, the six-sided function ma matrix. Um, don't have time to go into it now, but he, he very interestingly looks at all the different elements that make up uh, how we derive function in the products that we use. Uh, so th talking about uh, things like, like aesthetics, like the needs that humans have, like the uses that we put things to, uh, the association that particular products have with as aspects of the culture that we li live in. So I, I, I would highly recommend it. Another, interestingly, another uh, uh, monk uh, who uh, derived, you know, another very fam famous term uh, was William of Ockham. A lot of these uh, learned men over over the generations, uh, you know, obviously had a lot of time on their hands to study and read and uh, uh, derive philosophical thoughts on all of these uh, uh, things. And his uh, famous uh, area of study was that of looking at, I suppose, the natural world uh, and how it derives function and form. He came up with some interesting quotes there uh, that entities should not be multiplied without necessity uh, and given a choice between functionally equivalent designs, the simplest design should always be selected. So he was studying people like uh, Aristotle um, who are examining, I suppose, you know, how, you know, birds flew, um, how a, a, a fish swims in the sea, uh, and saying, you know, that they, they were, you know, a lot of the natural world is incredibly efficient and functional. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, its form has derived over many, many years. 
uh, to be incredibly efficient in how it goes about about its work. Uh, just a, a couple uh, of, of uh, products there that I suppose <clears throat> um, derive their strategy in terms of design from those thoughts. The likes of Apple, for instance, here, we all uh, know that they simplify and pair back every aspect of what they do, not just in a physical way, but also in terms of how the products are used. Yamaha there, uh, an example of a product from, oh, about 25 years ago now, of how they, they looked at, uh, I suppose, the technology uh, changes that were coming about in instrument design. The fact that, you know, we now can, can recreate the sound uh, electronically of a lot of uh, wind instruments and string. Here we have the example of a, ce a cello, which normally has this very large sound sound box used to create the sound um, in a very beautiful way. But if you have a digital format in which to recreate that sound, you don't necessarily need that large box, but you still need that form those particular points at which to hold it. You need to press it between your knees and you, you know it, it needs to sit on the top of your knee. You need to hold it in a particular way to play. Uh, but this particular one just folds out. So you, know, you don't have that huge volume of product uh, to carry around. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of, uh, you know, innovative way to change form and yet make it as functional as po po possible. So uh, other aspects of design thinking that you should know about. Um, in terms of human needs, uh, there was a... Uh, a psychologist or sociologist uh, called Abraham Ma Maslow, who in the 1940s came up with uh, a particular theory called the hierarchy of needs, um, and this looked at, I suppose, a lot of a lot of the basic standard human requirements that we all have in every sense, from a physical point of view, what we need in our bodies to live, but also kind of emotional, psychological, uh, creative aspects of, of uh, who, who we are and what, 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 what we do. Uh, and it has been used uh, by many, many pe people since then um, to create, I suppose, a set of needs that we all have. This is a particular design uh, uh, focused uh, pyramid or triangle, you can see it here, uh, looking at the different aspects of design that you should think about to, to make your pro product as interesting, as user friendly, uh, uh, to give your product um, the, lo the longevity that it needs to last in uh, the, mar the marketplace. So, uh, you know, you can see at the bottom there that your product needs to be fun functional. Uh, so that's a very important uh, aspect of it, that it meets the basic functional needs. So you can see that's why it's at the bot bottom. It needs to be reliable. Uh, the usability uh, is something that's very important. It needs to be proficient in what it does. It needs to empower people to do something uh, better or to do more of it. Um, but at the very top, where all of those things kind of coincide is the aesthetic beauty. So you can see that at the bottom of, of the triangle there, functionality is very important. It's, you know, it's kind of the first thing that everything is built on. Uh, but at the very top there, um, 
that part of it is where you add, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the aesthetic beauty, the formal quality of your particular product. product. So check that out. There's lots of information online, uh, and he wrote some interesting books about that field. Kevin, uh, are you? Do you want to con comment there or no? So no, no, I know I didn't say no. That's fine. Uh, so moving on, um, another interesting theory that you should all know about uh, in terms of product design is that of the golden ratio or golden rule. Now you've probably all heard about it. Um, it's perhaps the most famous uh, kind of, uh, you know, rule by which we create form. I listed there in the uh, in the chat space uh, the, the second video there uh, talks about the Fibonacci sequence or golden ratio. Now this is found uh, throughout the world. Pr practically every natural structure and form that we see around us, all the way from a seashell on the beach all the way up to ourselves and the buildings we're in, uh, the, uh, uh, the forests that we walk through, uh, right the way up to the solar si system and the universe, the ga galaxies within that universe, all seem to mysteriously coincide with this particular ratio. Uh, it's kind of a strange one. Uh, now, you, you'll see in the video that, you know, it's alluded to that perhaps uh, a higher being is involved uh, with with this. For me, personally, uh, I reckon that it has something to do with gra gravity, <laughs> since that is uh, one of the all-encompassing uh, forces that we have in the universe. You can see an image there, uh, just showing uh, a shell all the way to a to a you know a flower, a, 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 a bud all the way up to a storm that we might have out at sea. The waves that crash against the beach uh, fall in the very same uh, spiral form. Sunflowers all the way up to the ga galaxy uh, that we spin around in. Uh, it's incredibly uh, interesting, this whole field, and lots of people along the way uh, uh, have noticed, I suppose, uh, uh, that uh, those forms within the natural world. Now, it's kind of a little bit hard to see. It's, a, it's an image from a book uh, here which just uh, shows some examples of physical things around us that that used uh, this particular rule. We all know that it's uh, 1 to 1 1.618. Who knows why? Uh, you know, again, we all have theories on it. We have uh, Leonardo's uh, Vitruvian Man there, his famous drawing that, that we've all seen. And that demonstrates, I suppose, uh, that that rule, the ratio of uh, uh, size and length and form of parts. So we can see that the you know in the case of a human, that the upper uh, uh, leg uh, in ratio to the lower leg is one point six one eight. Same uh, goes for with the with the upper arm, lower arm, the proportions of the face. The height of the torso relative to the length, length of the leg. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, Grecian uh, architecture, uh, the example of the Acrop Acrop Acropolis there, uh, we have the width of it relative to its height is exactly the same. 
uh, we have the proportion of a typical violin, cello, uh, Notre Dame in, in Paris, a seashell, even, you know, examples from more recent times, you know, a Charles and Raymond's chair, uh, an Apple iPod. Designers have used this rule uh, so many times, and it creates not just a, you know, a functional benefit, but formally um, products that use this rule in some way uh, look better. They just naturally kind of sit with us in a better, better way. So just if you're, if you're coming up with forms and wondering what size and ratio of uh, uh, parts to use, that's an, in an interesting rule uh, to, to uh, take. Okay, moving on. Um, other areas that I want to uh, show you include this one, uh, biomimicry. It very much, I suppose, follows uh, on from our, our last er area there. And it looks at the whole world of uh, examining the natural world around us uh, and, and using a lot of the, uh, you know, I suppose, rules that it, it, it takes in order to create products uh, that we might use. Uh, one standout figure in this whole field is uh, Scotsman uh, Darcy Thom Thompson, who back in 1917 wrote a very famous book uh, called On Growth and Form. This one, uh, I, I actually wrote a thesis on, on this particular area back in my co college days. A uh, fascinating uh, world in which he e examines how... Uh, things grow. Uh, so it looks at e evolution, um, very much carrying on from uh, the writings of Darwin, you know, probably a hundred years prior, uh, and also looking at a lot of the findings that Ernest Haeckel, uh, who was an explorer back in uh, 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 the early 1900s, um, he wrote some incredible books and did incredible drawings of the findings uh, that he came, came, came across. So we can, uh, you know, see so many benefits in using some of the methods and the systems that the natural world uh, 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 us. One designer uh, in this particular field who stands out is Ross Love, Lovegrove, uh, who really has, you know, taken a lot of inspiration in terms of his forms and, and how things uh, work and look uh, from natural st structures. Uh, I would recommend checking out his work. He's created everything from houses to cars to street lights to uh, uh, furniture, every kind of pro product, all very, very beautiful forms. <clears throat> uh, the next area that I want to look at is that of uh, the life cy cycle. As we all know, uh, the natural world. Uh, rarely wastes uh, anything. Everything has a cycle of birth, uh, its life and its death, and is uh, con con consumed. Uh, you know, if a leaf falls from a tree, it is reabsorbed by that tree. Uh, uh, we as humans, on the other hand, uh, seem to have got into this uh, uh, you know, rut of creating a lot of waste, which uh, we're struggling, I suppose, uh, to reabsorb and to recycle, as we all know. So it's very important that product designers uh, uh, put a lot of thought into uh, what materials they are using, where those materials are coming from, how they're pro processed into the pro 
product. And then after uh, uh, its, uh, its product life, how are those materials reabsorbed? So this cycle is very, very important to examine uh, in as close a detail as we can. Now, we've all seen this in so many ways uh, through our day, daily lives. Um, lots of people have touched on it over the years. I, I spoke about design for the real world. Uh, Papanek uh, wrote another book later in, in his life uh, called The Green Imper Imperative, uh, where he examines all aspects of sustainability uh, in terms of pro products. I would highly recommend either of those books um, if you're interested in anything to do with product design um, and incredibly re relevant today. Another person that you should all uh, check out, and he's, he's, I think he's uh, uh, the first video that I've listed there on the left-hand side, uh, is this man. Uh, William McDonough is an American architect, designer, uh, uh, who has written lots of books and, and, and given really, uh, you know, uh, amazing uh, talks uh, all over the world on the topic of uh, the life cycle of things. Uh, he wrote a famous book called Cradle to Cra Cradle. Uh, and that particular talk, it's actually about 15 years old now, but it's uh, it's so important. He has, has given talks in more recent years kind of, uh, basically saying the same thing, you know, that, that, that we're not really learning uh, or we're, not, we're certainly not learning fa fast enough um, as humans. Um, but it's a, it's a mind-blowing talk, one of the most uh, incredible talks that I've ever, ever seen. So I'd recommend uh, that. Okay, uh, just before we take a break, I want to want to look at a, a couple of examples, I suppose, of uh, products and designers that I suppose use this whole notion of life cycle uh, and put it to the forefront in what they do. Um, one company here is uh, uh, Freitag, uh, F R E I T A G. Uh, this was started uh, by two Swiss brothers uh, back about 15 years ago uh, now. Um, they wanted to exam <coughs> uh, examine the whole area of baggage or luggage. Um, at, at that time, uh, I believe they were uh, couriers, they were uh, bike couriers in Geneva. And they were finding it very di difficult to come across a bag that would uh, uh, be very fun functional uh, and last a long, a long time and endure, I suppose, the routine that, that they had uh, every day. So they, uh, you know, scoured a lot of shops looking for bags and couldn't find one that was particularly tough. So they created uh, some bags out of kind of leftover uh, fabrics uh, that 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 they found. They wanted it to be a sustainable bag, so they were trying to reuse, you know, anything that they could they could find. Uh, being in that whole cycling kind of uh, road uh, area, they were looking at uh, things like trucks uh, and the tarps that most trucks have on their uh, sides. Could that fabric potentially be used to make a bag? So they got hold of some, uh, started to play play around with it. Uh, they were trying to find, um, you know, straps, uh, uh, clasps that might work in various ways, uh, and derived their first kind of set of prototypes um, using this. And they they quickly found that a lot of people were in, interested. Uh, several local shops got involved. 
start, started to sell uh, uh, what they created. And very quickly, it took off and has become an international success story. And this is uh, a photo from their uh, warehouse. Uh, famously, the Swiss go go government uh, uh, gave them a vast warehouse space, practically free or very, very low cost because they were doing such incredible work. And what they do is they take in uh, used tarps uh, from the transport uh, industry you can see the pallet loads that come in uh, every week there. And these uh, tarps, they're 40 foot long very often, um, probably about 10, 10 foot high. Uh, and they're laid out. Uh, all those kind of standard straps are removed. Uh, the tarps are then washed uh, very carefully in these large kind of industrial sized uh, washing machines uh, and then they're ta taken on uh, uh, and tem templates are used to kind of cut out the various parts of the bag um, kind of taking into account any any you know parts that might be ripped or worn uh, parts that might have an interesting kind of graphic or logo or color uh, and those parts are used then to sew up sew up the uh, bags you can see uh, an example of one there uh, so so you know things like um the straps uh, that are uh, you know standard seat belts from from cars uh, they use a lot of a lot of a lot of those uh, and all parts from uh, the bi bicycle world, even even kind of uh, trimmings for each bag are, are uh, old uh, 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 tubes from bi bicycles and from car wheels. So uh, a very interesting, sustainable pro product. They have a huge range sold all over the world. Um, and a, you know a great way to use a lot of the recycled materials that that are out there. So I check those guys out. Okay, uh, folks, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit hoarse here uh, from all this uh, talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a very short break. Uh, I'm gonna make a cup of coffee over here. Uh, so I'll be back in about two minutes time. If you all wanna. Take a take a short break. I mean, I'm gonna see you back in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, empathize step as being the problem uh, that we might have. Uh, we need to analyze that. So. If you're designing a new jacket to wear in in the rain. You need to define that as being the pro problem and examine every aspect of that that er area. So we need to take a, a set of jackets and go out on the hills, get in, get into the rain, understand, uh, you know, how we feel wear, wearing those uh, uh, gar garments. You know, is is the rain getting through the fat? fabric is it getting up your sleeve down your collar is it seeping through the various seams zippers whatever it might it might be and by examining the problem we can hopefully gain lots of information and lots of data on ways in which we might fix all of those things uh, so the next step then i suppose is to define some some kind kind of brief um, from all that information that research uh, you know you you very often kind of come up with a set of items that you need to have in your proposed pro product um, so it'll 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 be vague enough it'll it'll be well I want to in, in the case of our jacket you know I want um, a ja jacket which will be full length, 
which will cover our backside. It might need, need to have a hood. It might need to have zips instead of vel vel Velcro. Uh, it might need to be, be a particular color because it's relating to a particular environment or a particular market. It might need to have po pockets to store lots of different things. So defining uh, that brief, it's, as I said, it's relatively vague, but it's starting to put, you know, maybe the functional aspects of that product into some kind of sense. Once you've, you've gone through that step, you'll start to ideate. Uh, now that is simply coming up with as many ideas around the uh, brief as as you can, and that and that step can take lots and lots of different forms. It's also called, I suppose, concept generation, concept iteration. To iterate, I suppose, just means to come up with many many ideas based around a particular thing. Um, well, then, I suppose, pro prototype uh, from those. Now, a prototype can obviously, mo most of us think of it as a ph physical thing, uh, giving something a physical form. So we make models. Uh, we, we might make a full-size pro pro prototype. A prototype generally, using that term, means that it is fairly resolved. Um, that it's taken several kind of models uh, or mock-ups to get to that point of creating a pro prototype. So people can kind of misuse the term in many ways. They think of a prototype as being a very kind of uh, a first, uh, you know, attempt at creating a form. I would view it much more so as being a more finished thing, uh, that it's as close to the final product as you as you can get. Whereas those kind of sketch, you know, sketch mo models where you just get random bits of materials, put them together to see how things work, they're more kind of mock-ups uh, or models. Um, so you might you might you know. Uh, use the term prototype maybe later on when you're starting to generate uh, more re realistic uh, sizes and forms and using the actual materials that you're that you're planning planning to use the next step then is is to test uh, the testing phase uh, can take a long time depending on what pro product it is um, and of, and of course, you have to remem remember that this design process is, is kind of rarely in that lateral layout. Normally speaking, it actually goes in a loop that you're, you know, you might reach the end, you, you might test a particular pro product, and then, then you find that it do doesn't work and you need to go back to the start or back to ha halfway and then prototype again and test again, sketch again. So it can actually go in a series of uh, loops rather than in that um, uh, uh, logical uh, way. Now, a good web website to look at here uh, for in information about the design pro process is discoverdesign.org, uh, where they give you lots of information about all of those different steps. Another graphic here, uh, same five steps, uh, but it puts it in a just slightly different uh, uh, words here. Um, the first step being that you have a challenge. How 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 do you approach that uh, cha challenge? Second step, how, I, I've learned about certain things. How do I uh, interpret that information? Number three, to ideate. Uh, I see an opportunity with a particular uh, field. Uh, what what do I want to create? Uh, the next step, the prototyping step, uh, is where you have an idea, how, how do you build it? And then I've tried a particular thing, 
uh, how do I e evolve it? So there's lots of kind of variations on those five steps, um, but they're all essentially asking the same questions. Now, there's, uh, there's a slide here which just shows you uh, those kind of five steps uh, from start to fin finish here, top, top to bottom, uh, just in a more uh, expanded way. So if you're looking at the likes of uh, the research uh, uh, phase towards, towards the start, you might look at things like er ergonomics, uh, the purpose of your product, the cost, the, the construction of it. Um, you might have a whole set of data related to that particular field uh, that, that you might need to use. You, you then look at the shape and the form of it, you look at color, sizes so there's lots of uh, you know um, kind of expanded areas to each of those uh, steps that every product designer should look at certain people might specialize in certain things you might specialize I suppose in making prototypes you might start uh, as specialized in actually te te testing uh, pro products, which is a very important field. Uh, but I suppose every product needs to go through those, those steps. Now, just in terms of the research side of things, um, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, things I wanted to say about that, starting just with a, a great quote there. Uh, Henry Ford, as, as we all know, uh, had many, many incredible pro products um, and was one of the first uh, uh, people to come up with, you know, um, I suppose the modern approach to production line and to creating lots of innovations in terms of how his products were made. Uh, his famous uh, uh, quote there that he, if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster or horses. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute because, you know, uh, very often it's very important to ask people what what they want. Uh, so it's a kind of a double-edged uh, sword. You don't necessarily give them what they want, <laughs> but it is very important to ask. Um, so research in Design is a, is a huge field. There's lots of people that just specialize in this er area. Uh, people who compile, I suppose, data, you know, on various things. If you're interested in, um, you know, designing interiors of yachts, uh, there's a whole, you know, data set that you, you can get on uh, what the inside of a yacht needs to look like or needs to uh, what ways in which it needs to fun function all the uh, kind of rules and reg regulations that are that 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 you can find around the world based on uh, yachts so every particular aspect of of life will have a have a, da a data set that you can access in various ways. And I, I always mention at this point about um, your, your, the rights of your local LEO um, in, in uh, Carrick and in Sligo uh, will have tons of information on all of this data related to every field. Um, I did use my own um, LEO in Sligo a number of years ago to find out information on uh, exhibitions and, and the furniture field. Um, and they have large volumes of information from right across Europe. If you wanted to, for instance, sell a particular product into Ger Germany, uh, there's a whole, you know, reams of information uh, there on how to go about that and all the standards, regulations that, that uh, uh, the German go government have on particular pro products. Uh, 
Uh, anyway, uh, check out the local LEO. Um, this is a book that you all might be interested in. Uh, it's called Research Methods for Product Designers. And it's, it's, it's by uh, an Englishman and an Irishman. Alex Milton is uh, one of the heads of design in NCAD, uh, the National College of Art and Design, where they have a very good product design course. Uh, and a number of years ago, he uh, came together with an English uh, academic to write this book. Uh, it's used in a lot of the co colleges, I suppose, to teach students how to go about uh, their re research. Uh, just a page here taking some of the points from it. Uh, there's lots of ways in which we can go about our research if we're trying to come up with a, pro a product. We can interview co customers. Uh, we can uh, come up with various strategies within our particular bu business. Uh, we can go out into the field, uh, do kind of vox, vox pops, whatever uh, you like to call, call them, where, where we ask people on the street a, uh, you know, about a particular pro product. Uh, there's lots of tests, I suppose, you can do where you, you in interact with various groups uh, get you know a test group to uh, use the prototype that you might have uh, made you might uh, so like mind ma mapping uh, to create I suppose large charts or uh, um, you know word di diagrams uh, with lots of ideas or pointers uh, uh, that you might use. You might get get users to create di diaries or to keep a diary uh, of their use of a particular thing. If you're, you know, get, uh, trying to create that uh, that new outdoor coat, um, you might actually give someone a a particular pro prototype, get them to use it for a period of weeks or months. Uh, and get them to write down any thoughts that they might have. Um, and that information is, is absolute gold. Um, somebody physically using a thing uh, day in, day out, they're going to come up with lots of little, uh, little aspects of the product that, that do work or don't work uh, that, might, that might need uh, some work. So... Um, Obviously, uh, the likes of interviews with e experts, very important to talk to uh, as many people in the field as you can, get their guidance and uh, get them to judge uh, what, what, what they think of your pro product. Uh, and obviously, the data is very important. Um, other... Uh, Processes that you might like to use are the example there of a photo study. Um, I personally love uh, creating photo studies. Now, what is that? Um, here's the example from the book here of a, of a fantastic new pro product, Irish pro product uh, called Moo, Moo Call. Uh, Moo Call, you might have seen on the likes of the Late Late Show. Uh, I think it's been on, been on that. It's been on a number of um, uh, entrepreneurial shows, uh, and that is a is a is a device which the farmer ties around the uh, the uh, uh, tail of a cow, which is about about to give birth. And as as a cow gives birth, not that I know anything about it really, but as a cow gives gives birth, uh, seemingly the area uh, in its rear heats up and the tail also uh, tilts, as we would all expect. Uh, and this sen sensor in Mucol uh, sends a text to the farmer, who might be asleep in his bed or her bed, and uh, tells them that the cow is about to give birth so that they can go out to the, to the, to the barn uh, and keep an eye on the cow. 
So it it it, it it's a most, it's a really incredible pro- product and now being sold all over the world. This is um, a, a photo diary that was taken by the design team where they went out on farms, uh, looked at every aspect, all the different uh, elements that were involved in a you know a typical farm uh, uh, with a lot of cattle and where they were being housed uh, and so on and so forth and that gave them lots of information about kind of the uses where the thing was being used how it was being used uh, so it's a very help, help, helpful uh, method the other interesting and, and very commonly used uh, one is out of image and mood boards so if you're trying to create a new pro- product uh, as part of your uh, solving or, or coming up with a, a, a brief of some kind, um, you might, you know, stick a lot of photographs, drawings, um, take them from magazines, take them from the web, and put those down on boards. And it gives you a great kind of flavor of the direction that you would like to take. So that's a very common, commonly used one. Okay, I'm going to move swiftly on. Uh, quarter past twelve, so I'm, I'm anxious uh, that we don't run, run over too much. Um, okay, so let's just look at uh, more specific areas. Um, this is a good slide uh, that I put together uh, that I would like you all to kind of uh, uh, work on. If if we can get these five points related to our pro- product uh, uh, worked out. If we can fill them in, I think I think it's a very good starting point uh, uh, that we could all uh, uh, use. So, what I'd like to look at is what is your pro- product? What idea do you have? So, the first one there is in order to. Do do a particular thing. So, what is that? Is that you know uh, your vision of how uh, all weather coats are going to be in the next ten years? Uh, so, write that down. Uh, your product will then solve a particular thing. So, the target audience then you know it's going to solve a particular functional problem within a particular field so what is that and then define you know specifically what you're going to do is there something new about your pro- product that no other product has um, and and give them then a strategy so you're going to you know install a, a certain set of steps you're going to have have some uh, uh, functional uh, aspects of your product that will hopefully solve that pro- problem and we will know if our product works when we see x uh, what goal do you have you want to create a product which uh, is 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 going to fulfill all of those basic needs that you can, you know, that you derived from all, all your research work. So, if you have a think about that page, I know it's perhaps a little bit confusing there uh, in in the various steps, but it it'll give you a little bit of focus in terms of what your goals are, what type of vision you have for your pro- product. Okay. <clears throat> Further to that, um, I suppose what we're get, getting at here is trying to understand uh, people's motivations, their needs, their problems, ways of thinking, and day-to-day life. I think if we can all just take a take a moment to to look at that slide and go, okay, what are uh, the motivations that people have? for this particular area again outdoor clo- clothing uh, uh, people are motivated by um you know uh, i suppose being able to enjoy uh, all weather environments in a very comfortable uh, way what do they need what problems do they have 
So we can all have a think about those two slides and hopefully uh, come up with, with uh, you know, a strong foundation on which we can build our pro product. Now let's just look at some of the uh, normal ways in which people start to ideate. Uh, pretty much everybody, in my view, can draw in some shape or form. Uh, these are just some examples of, uh, you know, a typical uh, a sketchbook that a product designer will have, where they, in this case here, they're designing a uh, type of bin, I suppose. And you can see that they're, they're just coming up with lots and lots of ways in which a bin could function and could look. So very important to uh, to to work up as many as as you can. Um, rather than just kind of thinking about it a lot and coming up with one you know a single way in which to do a particular thing, uh, I, I always say 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 to people try to sketch and doodle as much as you can and and and, and sketch numerous var variations of how something can be done because that gives you a reference point you know that you started here then you thought of adding on this adding on that changing the color or changing the form there and it documents, I suppose, the way in which we think. So that's very important down, down the road, uh, uh, you know, in terms of showing uh, people how the pro process of design evolved. Uh, so it's, it's very ben beneficial for, for yourself as well. Um, so just a couple of examples there, you know, just showing in this case they're designing a water bo bottle and just var variations on form and shape. Uh, now in terms of uh, prototype typing, um, there are lots and lots of ways in which to do this. Most of the time uh, people just start with paper and card, uh, folding them and gluing them. Um, you can, of course, uh, use various plastic pro products, uh, uh, different types of foam. You can carve them, you can shape them, you can sand them. Uh, here they're obviously designing a, a cordless drill. Um, putting physical form on products is so important. Uh, you have to make that, that step between a sketch and a, and a, 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 a form, a 3D form, uh, fairly fast, particularly in the case of something which is, which is handheld, since you need to fit it into um, a person's hand. What is the most ergonomic uh, uh, form that, that the product should, should take? Uh, we can also obviously use uh, the technology that we have. If, if we can scan particular things, we can create uh, you know, a 3D model of a particular form. Uh, and, and, and that form can be modified in lots of ways, and we can use 3D, 3D print, printers then to, to print off variations. So product designers today will use technology like that to uh, to iterate lots of uh, examples of what they what they would like like to do makes it very very fast um, another example there of a company you might check out uh, layer design they're based in the UK uh, they design numerous different pro products uh, but you, you can uh, uh, simply use, you know, old-fashioned tools, uh, a good cutting board, sharp knife, some cardboard. Uh, here they're they're mocking up variations on on a uh, dining dining chair, uh, but it really doesn't have to cost a lot of money to create prototypes. You can grab a bunch of cardboard uh, from your local shop and a few pieces of wood and very, very quick, quickly uh, generate some form. Uh, so that's what I'd love to see you all do.
Now, testing an area uh, which we won't delve too much into, uh, there are so many aspects to this this particular area that it would take take a few hours to get to get through. Um, one thing that you, sh you should all think about again is uh, the likes of focus groups. Focus groups are a great way to test anything, uh, whether you're testing the initial phases of an idea or whether you have a physical product as, as we spoke about, uh, they can actually uh, uh, derive a lot of great information. So you need to design that, you need to define who that focus group is, um, so the user uh, group, what age, uh, whether they're male, female, uh, what, you know, what what uh, 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 part of the world they might live in. Um, so you can do that in lots of ways. Gather up all the data, analyze the data, and that can help help you a lot. Uh, but but there are, I suppose, physical uh, tests that can be made. Here we have uh, Pearson Lloyd, uh, a famous UK product design uh, firm. Uh, and here, uh, again, from that book that I spoke about, uh, they are testing a, a commode uh, for use in, uh, in hospitals and so, so on. Uh, so here they're they're creating you know a test rig uh, out of simple pieces of wood and varying I suppose the angles and the heights and the depths and so so on uh, to get everything just right and they're te te testing the use of different phones there. So test rigs are very important. Uh, you can uh, obviously go down the road of scientific uh, testing of your particular product. A lot of pro products will need to be te tested um, in whichever market they're planning to be sold in. Uh, the, the light of UL, uh, the underwriter's laboratory, uh, uh, or otherwise known as UL, uh, have labs pretty much all over the world. Uh, and they will undertake testing, particularly if it's an electronic good um, that might have ca uh, cabling, uh, electronics might need, need to be connected to the mains. Um, those pro products, it's very important that they are te tested and passed uh, in order to be sold in any mar marketplace. So uh, uh, you can look up the UL site. Um, it can be quite expensive to get a product tested by them, um, but you, you very often uh, won't be allowed to sell into a particular market without a test having been carry, carried out. If anybody is interested in that, we can we can talk more. You do obviously have testing rigs that you can use. Um, good example there of an office chair. Uh, uh, these these rigs can be used to test. You know, uh, basically uh, uh, the stre stresses that might be involved with a person sitting on a chair fifty thousand times. Um, a test of you know the strength of all the parts. Uh, so if your product passes a test like that, um, it certainly raises the bar in terms of of of, of the price of the product, uh, and it can have a bearing on who who actually buys it. You know, if you're if you're trying to sell it into a particular uh, chain of shops, they might ask, well, has it passed such and such a test? If it has they'll take it on, and if not, they won't. So testing can be a very important er er area. Now, just very briefly, I'm going to talk about packaging. Um, I've just a couple of slides here, and then we'll get on to any questions that you might have. Um, we could spend the whole day just looking at pa packaging. Packaging is so important, uh, certainly when it comes to physical things, physical pro products. Um, the vast majority of packaging, I suppose, uh, is cardboard. Uh, it's the most sustainable way in which to put some kind of covering on your on your goods. 
we have a, a, a very sharp movement away from the use of pl plastic uh, these days for obvious re reasons. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, biodegradable pl plastics coming on stream, which is great to see. Uh, the likes of cornstarch and so on being used. Um, but I suppose cardboard is still uh, the main fo focus. Uh, and there's so many innovative uh, examples, these are just some uh, gleam from the web, uh, of ways in which we can package things. The example of eggs and fruit here, um, you know, how can we be clever about uh, uh, the pa packaging of those goods and move away from those plastic kind of uh, uh, netted bags or, or just putting everything into a plastic bag? Uh, can we use cardboard? Uh, a very funky kind of, uh, you know, attra attractive way to go about that there. Um, interesting little product from a company here selling a starter dog kit. I believe they, this is an Irish uh, uh, firm. Uh, in, inside the box, you find all the little uh, things you need if you've just bought a, bought a dog. Uh, like a, a leash and a little ball and uh, different name tags and various things for your dog. A nice, a nice little pro product. Uh, but a very, very simple box there, printed uh, with e eco uh, ink, and you get different colours. Uh, so you know, even if your product has something as simple as a, as a as a standard box. Uh, which you lay out and print in various ways, that will that will certainly go a long way uh, to helping your product uh, in in the mar the marketplace. Now, now another great example there from the world of pa packaging. Um, this guy is a Bihar. Uh, again, I think I, I've put him in one of the links. Uh, he runs a company in the States called Fuse, and they design everything, uh, you know, uh, uh, many, many different pro products at this at this stage. This was one they did for Puma. Uh, Puma wanted to redesign uh, the boxes that their shoes came, came in. And instead of offering yet another cardboard box, they came up with something which actually used something like only 40% of the pa pa packaging uh, their previous box used. Uh, so the, the, the shoes come a very simple little folded cardboard uh, 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 pack, and then it goes inside a bag. Um, so there's no pl plastic involved, uh, everything flat packs, and uh, it, it uses incredibly few materials which can all be recycled. But still, it's very strong in terms of brand, branding. Uh, so they, they save the company millions, tens of millions every year by reducing the amount of materials that went into their pa packaging. Uh, so, so, you know, they examined every aspect of how the whole process of packaging goods and getting them out to the shops uh, works and come up with a very, very cle clever uh, pro product. Uh, some laser cut uh, cardboard packaging there. We can, of course, I think that slide is slightly blurred there for some reason, um, which you can see on the left. Laser cut cutters and engravers are great in terms of pa packaging because, of course, you can create lots of beautiful uh, designs on the actual box. Uh, so we can do that for you. Uh, we could cut out um, examples of a particular box if you have something in mind. Uh, so let us know if you want to talk to us about, about, about that. Um, just a couple of other examples there. Um, you can see here, uh, instead of cardboard, these uh, uh, boxes and covers and so on uh, use plywood. 
so plywood, you know, in its in its very thin form, can be used to etch on and and create very simple uh, but strong uh, bo boxes. So. Yeah, if if anybody is interested in that whole area, just get in touch and we can we can talk more. Okay, I think I'm coming to the end here. Uh, just a, just one interesting aspect of packaging design here. A lot of companies uh, using artists to design uh, a kind of you know batches of of a particular box or pack. So. Um, it adds adds a level of culture, a le level of color. Uh, it's very eye ca catching, um, and it's one aspect of packaging which is which is certainly on on the rise. Okay, uh, I think that's it uh, for the moment. Um, now we're just on half half past twelve. Um, hopefully. You, you've got some ideas there. It's a lot of information to take in. Uh, we've got lots of videos for you there to look at on the uh, left-hand side. And then I've, I've also put together that page of links, which uh, I believe Stuart has put up on the web website. Um, I will do, yeah. I'll pick those up. Yeah. And they should be up by tomorrow, um, along with the, the recording of today as well. Great. Okay. So um, I know that some of you may have to scoot off, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, certainly feel free to ask. Uh, you can type into the uh, chat bar on the left hand side. Um, any questions on today's talk? Um, I found the, the process uh, very interesting that you're actually going from a, how would you say, a physical idea and also the psychology of the idea as well. Um, I think we spoke about yeah. the, the, how a customer felt about a product and with my product, sure. the, you know, you brought up the, um, the aspect of safety and uh, how, how safe the customer felt, which was which made me think again in a different way um, about, okay. about yeah. the product, you know. Yeah. So, so Kevin, you're you're ta talking there about about your product, which is um, you know, I suppose a pod in, into which a, a customer sits to to get 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 get. get 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 their hair cut, I suppose, isn't it, uh, yeah. or or styled? Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a very particular uh, area, and as as Stuart and I said just just in emails, um, that it's very you know very difficult to kind of uh, separate yourself. Uh, from a per person, if I'm if I'm you know cutting my hair, you have scissors, uh, 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 combs, and so so on. Uh, you need to be very precise about how you're how how you're doing doing that. So uh, the, the whole area of P PPE, uh, we spoke about that. That you know. Um, we, we are now, in the next week or two, all going to be going back to get our hair cut. I can see mine is <laughs> getting long. Uh, I believe Stuart uh, uh, got his uh, carried out at home. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's an area that, that, that we're facing in, into now where how, how does a barber or a hairdresser Dresser go about cutting cutting hair very close to someone, uh, and yet you know abide by the rules uh, that that the government have put put out. So, I think the starting point for you 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 you, you have obviously done a, done a lot of work, and I think I think the prototype that you that you've mocked up there is great. Uh, but I think you need to examine 
what the government are saying about how that can be done. You know, how close someone can be, what what uh, PPE needs to be there. Yeah. By uh, bringing in the the concept of a screen, like a physical screen uh, made out of maybe some kind of pl plastic, I think that, that could help a lot. But um, I think it would need to be completely clear and that how how the person's hands would operate behind that screen mm. needs to be incredibly free. You know, you yeah, need you need yeah. to be able to physically see your hands, see the tools that are in in your hand, see the per person's head from from all an angles. So whether the person gets turned on the chair so that you can physically work on them, it, it's very precise. It you know you need to put a lot of thought into it. Um, I'm just not sure if 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 just having a full uh, PPE uh, body suit would actually be the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought that as well. I thought of, uh, um, but that would <laughs> that would come across probably more scary than anything if someone appears in a full chemical uh, type uh, suit. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know it's 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 a very tricky area. Like we're all faced with with how we're going to deal with with getting back out in into the world. You know how how we we can we can use a you know a restaurant again. How we can go go to a bar. How we can use uh, tra transport again. Um, so there's all these various fields in which. Uh, we need to protect ourselves and protect the pe pe people we share that space with. So your, yours is just a very precise, very particular one. Uh, the likes of a doctor, the likes of a dentist will be faced with the same, the same uh, things. Um, personally, I just, I just think that you know, any any environment where you're going to have a lot of pe people, schools, for instance. Uh, how do you put people in the same room, you know, not just sitting on a chair next to one another? Uh, if we're in the same room, you know, and there's people coming and going, it's not just the same uh, people in that, in that space. We're going to have to get them to not only wash their hands, uh, but put on a mask and potentially wear uh, visors, wear gowns that will cover our body. That's just the way for, forward. Uh, so I think you need to just just uh, really uh, watch what the go government is saying uh, and what rules are going to be in place. And then base, base the pro product that, that you're working on, on on that. I guess the other thing also is that... Um the protocols in which you know you do something you, you, you know that is also a design process to think about that in terms of like you know i, I like i say to you, I, i'm not exactly sure how your particular barber shop is set up or whatever but you know the designing you have to think about the the greater kind of design thing about designing the space and the environment that you're you're in and, and and maybe think about redesigning that space to a, accommodate these protocols that that, that we all yeah. have, that we're, we're all going to have yeah. to adhere yeah. to. You know? We're all stripping back um, you know? everything to the basics, really, so that there's uh, less areas yeah. um, that can be infected or you know yeah. um, exactly yeah. On, um, so that, yeah. germs and stuff. Yeah, so that in itself is a design process that you're going to have to go through. So you know that that just apply that same kind of like you know thinking to you know to that as to you know how you're going to actually tackle the sort of like the the one-on-one -on -one interaction with with the customers you know um but i think like leo saying that that it's 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 gonna have to be a balancing act kevin between sort of like um functionality <laughs> and you know usability you know yeah, <laughs> like you know yeah um and with safety being the sort of like the, the the top of that you know 
sort of like you know hierarchy of needs almost isn't it really yeah that's that's yeah. that's the one you know? yeah, yeah. yeah it's just i i i mentioned uh kevin that you know if 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 i was sitting in the chair uh, getting my hair cut, I I would want the per person to 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 be able to access all of my head without any bar barrier because they they have a very sharp tool in their hand. Um, so you know that would be first and foremost in in my mind, not yeah. necessarily con contracting the vi virus. To be honest, <laughs> um. It, it goes without que question that uh, everybody will have to be, you know, uh, disinfected. So, as a as a barber, I think that you know any any barber will really have to up their their oh, game well, in terms of how that's done. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be protocols as regards to um, PPE, Definitely, yeah. as regards to sanitation, um, carrying out the procedure, um, disinfecting between customers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, the whole thing, the whole experience is going to change um, compared to what it was before. Like a lot of industries, we have to adapt and we have to innovate as well um, and find new ways of doing things. So, uh, that's definitely, yeah, that's definitely going to happen. It has to. Yeah, I think I think how how you actually advertise that fact as well, you know, is very important. Like, you know, a person needs to feel confident before they come in that that all of that is in is in is in yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. Because I have seen I have seen a lot of variation. I mean, you know, the government have set out a set of sta standards uh, that we've all come across, but they seem to be implemented in in various ways you know uh, I'm, waiting. I'm waiting this week hopefully we'll get the full protocol of um what's required as reg as regards to ppe etc for um barber and hairdressing industry whereas yeah. at the moment it's, it's a general um it's a, a general specification across all industries of how to use ppe what's going to be required so just to get a final um more specific one for for my business um hopefully that will come this week like the guidelines will say you have to wear gloves you have to have a mask etc there's all there's a lot of yeah. talk of all the different ways ppe can be used um and that's what i'm waiting for to find out you know yeah. what are the final requirements yeah 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 i think i think um you know, there there might be a kind of a simple way in which you can bring in some added pro pro protection to you know what you need to do. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a pod. It it, it could just be a, a you know a screen uh, that uh, se separates the two, but just can can function in a very particular way that I'm you know I'm thinking in my own head that it's a that it's a polycarbonate uh, panel perhaps with holes in yes and you can still do all the work that the, the, there's a just a very simple barrier there but again if if you've got the uh, scenario of well you know everybody's decked out in P, PPE. Um, and you're working on on their head. Uh, should basically the the barber just have a, vi a visor to stop yeah. to stop the spread and the transmission uh, from from their mouth? You know, um, does it? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if you had a full screen and you had holes in it for the hands to pass through, well, then it's it, it kind of limits things a bit. You know, you can't necessarily get around to you know to shape the hair in the same way. So that's it, what I it's found with, sorry, that's what I found with um, with uh, hard materials that you didn't have that flexibility. Whereas with the softer um, tent like material, you can actually you have a bit more flexibility. Uh, well, a lot more flexibility than you do with a hard, rigid um, material. Sure. So maybe sure. It's a question of, of of working on that um, in some simpler form rather than a pod 
um, some, 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 maybe some protection around the chair or something, but on a much smaller scale uh, with much more flexible um, material. Yeah, sure, That's what sure. Sort of think in my head now. Yeah, I think I think another ad aspect which uh, you know has has I will see a big change is uh, any any air conditioning uh, in uh, either a hairdresser or a, bar a barber that will need to be looked at. Yeah. Um, any space in which people uh, uh, the pu public are are coming in and sit for a period of, of time li literally any space all the air the air con that's in that space will need to be upgrade graded uh, if it's not in place you'll certainly need 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 some and um, so like that that's a huge statement what I just said there like if you if you think about um, a lot of barbers let's let's say won't have that in place no. They won't. They won't have any, you know. Um, so that's 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 an aspect which I came across there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the government were making statements in various ways on it. Um, so I think that's that's an industry that you could see a lot of change and a lot of business in, you know. <laughs> um, because I think and filtering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just. You know, if you have some people in the same space for a period of time, you need to extract the air, and um, that that could really improve things in terms of the the battle that we have against uh, co co COVID. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of, so, lots of food for uh, Kevin, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it's very much an ongoing thing. I, literally, by the day you're going to hear more about about what you can do what you can't do what you're gonna gonna need so uh keep us posted on it you know uh, on it all if if you want to send us an email again um we can certainly we could help with putting you in touch with somebody that knows something about a particular field or how to access a material or get things yeah. cut uh whatever it is just let us know yeah, I think I'm going to go and um, go back to what you were saying about the the principles of design, and really go back to the what 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 is the problem, and uh, the how do I solve the problem and functionality and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, Great. Yeah. So Brilliant. Back, Brilliant. It's back to the drawing board, basically. Well, well you know that's that's very often the case. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I said, you can get to the end and then realise that. Like you brought up the point as regards to safety and how the customer perceived the, you know, the my solution. So yeah. I have to go back, maybe like you said, to maybe the middle and change yeah. certain things of the design or whatever to, you know, to ho overcome that problem. Like you yeah. said, maybe not yeah. an odd system. Yeah, I think it's it's so important to ask ask as many pe people as you as you can about 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 what you're trying to do i mean everybody will have something to say whether yeah. it's positive or negative whether you have to have to go back to the start or whether you just need a little a little tweak or to add a certain thing everybody's gonna gonna help so yeah. the more you talk about it the more you'll learn you know yeah yeah exactly like I keep going back to the point of you saying about how the customer felt is 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 so important you know so yeah that made me think yeah again. so okay so, great thank you for listening well, thanks for that yeah and uh, okay. we're on the next week at 11 o'clock are we so yeah absolutely it's, it's yeah. me next week um talking about um sort of like digital fabrication processes and and equipment and you know sort of uh getting into the technology side of uh of the of the whole design thing right, and okay. uh okay well, right cool. so all right if i've got any problems i'll, I'll give you an email um absolutely drop some mail thanks very much that's great okay yeah. Kevin, thanks okay. a lot